All right. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of The Jake Dunlap Show. We are very excited that you joined us. If you haven't tuned in, this is the show where we talk to celebrities, thought, and industry leaders to really discover their journey to success. I am super excited that you're joining us. This show is like no other. I can promise you that. You might laugh. You might cry, but you will definitely leave inspired and gain a whole new level of insight into those people that you follow, love, and admire. All right. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of The Jake Dunlap Show. Uh, Today's guest is going to be a fun one. Um, You know, I talk to a lot of different CEOs, right? They come from finance and accounting. They were ex-lawyers. Uh, They worked at IBM or Deloitte or something. Uh, Today's guest, and what I think is really exciting, is just a true definition of, you know, it's it's about the the work. It's about uh, taking the knowledge. And it really is about, and I had Guy Kawasaki on the, the, the podcast, and he said this, he said it best. He said, everybody should go into sales. His very first job was he was you know selling jewelry, right? This gentleman was an AE at a rapid growth company and now uh, is currently the founder of one of the most exciting companies in SaaS in the enablement space. And so please uh, really join me in welcoming everyone, Mr. Ted Blosser. Ted, welcome to the show. Jake, thanks for having me on. Yeah, I'm excited. It's going to be a fun conversation. So so look, in the show, you know, look, we talk a lot about people's journey in the show. And we talk about, you know, what I find is it's like the things that happen to us. Sometimes it's like when we're 10 years old. Um, sometimes it's when we're later in life, etc. are really what kind of set us up for, you know, future success. So before we kind of get into like, you know, your, your career tra- uh, transition and trajectory, let's maybe start with back in the day. You know, like, where are you from? Like, where did you grow up? Um, like, what are some maybe early memories you have, like up through, you know, kind of growing up in high school around business and, you know, things that have really stuck with you? For sure. So a little background on myself. I was actually born in uh, Taipei, Taiwan. Uh, my dad was an expat who moved out there and uh, moved us back to the States when I was four um, and uh, learned a ton from him overall. I would say from the early days, it wasn't like I dug into sales um, and uh, let's say sold candy on the street corner or uh, had my own business when I was young. I would say it all right. started to click uh, during the college years for me. And so um, when I, you know, I went to Santa Clara University uh, out here in Northern California, and that was really when I got the first kind of glimpses into the high tech scene what yeah, that was like, um, one of my first mentorships and um, sorry, internships in college uh, with one of my first mentors was really what got me onto the professional track and uh, really, really got me kickstarted into sales as a profession. And that was really where I started. But that was kind of the, the original story, but really kicked into high professional gear in, in, in the college years. What kind of, you know, growing up, obviously, I mean, are you a Steve Nash fan? I guess would be my other question. Uh, I'm a yes, huge Steve big, Nash fan. The, the run and gun. I saw, I saw you uh, uh, went to ASU. Definitely the run and gun. Um, Phoenix Suns of uh, Steve Nash and Amari Stoudemire. Oh, definitely was best. a fan during those years. Uh, and that so, was the best. I was um, in Phoenix. Then. Yes. So I was in Phoenix during those years. And I this is not a joke. There was a, uh, a uh, we were out for New Year's. And we're at this kind of, you know, kind of like, like private club thing and we're sitting there there's a group of probably 10 of us and all of a sudden the woman comes over and is like can you guys make room like we have someone else coming in and it's steve nash sitting like right next to me i'm like oh my gosh gosh. this is the the (laughs) coolest thing ever um and now he's with the nets man which i really hope he does well because then i've lived in i lived in brooklyn for five years too so um, you know, I, I hope that he continues to thrive. So shout out to Steve Nash. Well, I'm hoping they, they, tra- they, they trade uh, Durant over oh, to God. Phoenix, which would be great. Oh my gosh. Uh, that whole, that whole fiasco, you know, it's like Kyrie and then James Harden and then Durant. It's like the Nets were like setting up this like triad of amazingness. And then all of a sudden it just all, it all, I mean, what did you think is going to happen, you know, in, in retrospect? <laughs> so for all my NBA fans out there, feel free to leave your comments on, 
uh, what's going to happen to the Nets. I still hope that they do well. So we'll see what happens. Um, so, all right. So, you, so how did you pick sales though? Like out of all the professions and things that you could have done, like how, how was it that you like, was it like, Hey man, like this is, cause that's what it was for me. I mean, I'll just straight up tell you, like I, I got my degree in entertainment management um, and I wanted to work in sports and to get into job in sports. One of the best ways to do that was in sales. And so, uh, you know, I took a job and then I realized like, wow, like this is something that I'm, I'm passionate about and, you know, built a successful career as a VP of sales and, you know, CEO now, but it definitely wasn't a, I'd done it in, t in college. So I knew I had some natural ability, but it wasn't like as well, you know, call it thought out. How, you know, how did, how did you land on sales, you know, coming out of Santa Clara? Yeah, I would say the most influential experience of going down that initial career path was my first internship was at a executive boutique executive recruiting firm the June Ooh, my junior boutique, year of course of college. It's boutique. I know <laughs> and they were doing VP sales VP of business development placements all over the valley and I essentially just responded to the the job listing on our internal career site and that was fascinating to me. I didn't know I was really getting into sales. It was actually more advertised as a more of a back office job. But I had such a good right. mentor, this guy, uh, Guy Margard. And he said, hey, Ted, I'm, I'm, um, I have a, a few roles open. Here's one for VP of sales. I want you to go on LinkedIn at the time and Zoom Info is still very early on and just start cold calling people you think could be a good fit. And instead of having me just do back office work, he had me hitting the phone, selling essentially jobs. And I, I didn't even know I was really doing sales at the time. And so <laughs> that's a really you. good you foray. Into yeah, sales. I know. <laughs> I mean, I'm 20 years old, calling executives around the valley and pitching them. I didn't even know what Sequoia was. I didn't even know what Kleiner Perkins was. I was just <laughs> kind of reading the sheet of paper in front of me, but I just treated it like a standard conversation. And uh, it was just such a good foray into sales. We had we had the best summer that summer. We placed Several candidates was a record for this guy at the time uh, in the span of just two months. And a lot of that was from the early kind of prospecting he allowed me to do. Meanwhile, they had other interns kind of just doing some of the back office stuff. And he let me let me loose into uh, essentially the, the, the hard world of sales right from the get go there. Yeah. And, and calling into some of those. Yeah, I, I remember my first. So I was the director at the time of sales at Glassdoor. And um I didn't really know anything. Like, it's kind of funny. I came from like a larger tech company. So I really didn't know a lot about startups. This is 2010. And I, I didn't realize like the, the, like how cool, like the board or like how big time it was. And then I'm watching super pumped. And, and I remember like, I used to sit next to Bill Gurley at these board meetings, not no clue. And Rich Barton and these guys, and I'm watching super pumped. This is the Uber story, uh, et cetera. But, um, you know, it's just like, I think when you're early on and, and like, and I think it was because of that, I had like no fear. Like I didn't realize like the stakes that I was playing at this time. And you just kind of like let go and, you know, you kind of do your best as, you know, as much as you can. Yes. Great show, by the way, big fan. Uh, but you're totally right. In those early days when you don't really know, when you're not even getting a commission paycheck, you're just paid on the intern salary. And you don't really know all the exposure you had. I was meeting with <laughs> other CEOs of venture back companies. It's so such a good experience just to cut your teeth. Um, uh, in the business world, really, for the first time. So it's so happy I had that experience. Crazy. Well, I was 30 and still didn't know if that makes you feel any better. Um, <laughs> so I figured I figured it out later. So so let's just talk, you know, about the journey. You know, over the over the years, you know, since you you graduate, um, and 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 then kind of we can get into kind of why you started WorkRamp. You know, obviously, kind of coming into a space that in particular is you know, like there's players in the space, right? Like the idea yep. of, you know, some type of, you know, enablement, onboarding and you know, tr learning management is not like a new, new place. So how did you kind of make that leap? And, you know, kind of for the people out there, I think would also be helpful as you're kind of talking about that, like, what are some key moments where you kind of like leveled up to that next level in your career? Or, you know, kind of key learning of like, oh, this is what I want to do. I don't want to do this, or this prepared me for this. And what are some of those like key moments from kind of making the move from being in sales to then starting your own company? Yeah, for sure. And so when I graduated, I went and worked at Cisco Systems. And this was back, I remember back in the two, this was mid 2000s. It was very cool to be a 
sales CEO, which John Chambers was um, yeah, John at the Chambers, time. Yeah, for sure. And I got to go kind of learn from the best. And I was an AE in the field for about four years at Cisco. And at that time, I thought, hey, sales is the thing. I'm going to do this for the rest of my life. Um, but right around that era, um, that was when Facebook was getting really big. That's when let, let's call it Web 2.0 was really having a mm -hmm. big uh, resurgence. And I caught the startup bug and I said, hey, you know what? I want to go do my own thing and use my sales skills. I had a failed startup right away after Cisco. Uh, we won't go into that story unless you want to. That oh, was a good, definitely. Good, no, uh, no, no. You can't skip over that story. <laughs> Let's talk about it. So like, tell, tell us yeah. a little bit about, so, so you're in sales was, and you're like, I'm going to start my own company. I guess my first question is like, Look, look, you're working at Cisco. If you have a four year run, you're making good money, right? Like, it's not like you're, yep. you're doing poor. You're working at one of like the top companies, you know, for B2B sales at that time, and, and especially on the channel side. What made you start your own company? Like, where do you think you got that? Like, oh, I'm going to start my own thing. Yeah. When I was at the tail end of Cisco, I was actually at this time, I was actually offered another job to almost double my pay as a huge AE promotion. And I said, you know what? I want to go do my own thing. And the when I look back on the period, it's almost a period of almost too much hubris, personal hubris, I would say. And I said, hey, I, I think I could be the next Mark Zuckerberg. Um, I'm watching all these people start their own companies, get rich, make it overnight. And I said, you know what? I can do that. What, what's different of from, from uh, I'm, between I'm 20, us? I'm 28. Right? <laughs> I can do this. <laughs> Yeah. And at that time, I would think, yeah, it's 25, maybe 26. Yeah. And so I just quit my job on a whim and I go start essentially a Pinterest competitor at the time. It's called Stuffbox. And uh, we were targeted uh, completely at the wrong demographic. We were targeting um, uh, essentially uh, men uh, between 16 and 25, which is the yeah, exact wrong demographic of yeah, what that's not it. Uh, actually ended up winning the category, which was Pinterest. And that was a really humbling experience. I basically burned through all my savings, um, didn't get to product market fit, uh, had a big humbling experience overall from a, from a, a leadership perspective, how to actually work day to day with uh, potential venture capitalists, couldn't really raise any money. And, and that essentially be, what became just a gigantic learning lesson of how not to run a startup. And so I'm so glad I went through that roughly two years or so period because it showed me, hey, uh, there's a big divide between entrepreneur and an actual entrepreneur and that you actually need to learn from the best in the category to actually uh, help uh, mitigate your chances of failure and actually uh, increase your chances of success. And so after that huge failure, that was when I went to uh, box. And I said, Hey, you know what? I need to go build up my savings again. I need to go learn from the best. How do I go build the skills I need to actually go give this another shot? And that was what led me into uh, going to box for about five years, uh, where I worked in both sales and then later in uh, product management as well. That's awesome. Yeah. And that was, I mean, that would have been what through the IPO or is that right? Yes, after the IPO? it was before and after the IPO. Yeah. Great, great memory. It was um, a couple of years before the IPO, and then I uh, got to stay there about a year after the IPO. So, total of five years there. Ton of learnings That's from cool, there man. too, as well. And then, and then, and then, how how WorkRamp? You know, talk a little bit about that. Like, what was the, you know, yeah. again, like how did you land? Yeah, how did you land on on that as the thing? So, towards the end of my tenure at Box, and at Box, I did about two and a half years of, of SaaS sales. That was my first time doing SaaS sales. So, I learned a ton. So I would call it like a early SaaS um, uh, a pioneer with Aaron Levy that I got to watch. Um, and then, towards my end of my time there, when I transitioned to product management, I said, Hey, I feel like I'm ready. I feel like I have the skills to go start another company again. And I said, look, I have the sales skills now. I have the product skills now. I feel like I'm ready. And the criteria that I had was a little different than a lot of other founders. A lot of other, other founders might have been scratching their own itch or grew up around a specific problem set. Right. I uh, said, hey, I want to go into a category that is very, very large that I can make a dent in and that there aren't many comp uh, uh, good competitors in. And then two, I want to uh, have a company that has an amazing culture and I can build 
um, a place that people essentially want to, I call it skip into work, where they just find so much joy heading into the virtual office now that we have. I um, mean, it's just a fantastic place to work. So those were my two criteria. I said, look, I care a lot about the category we go into. And then two, I care a lot about the company that we built. And so um, the former was actually uh, a, a big research pro process, looking at different categories, seeing what was interesting. And we stumbled across the LMS category, which one had a ton of competitors. There's about 600 competitors on G2 in the LMS category alone. <laughs> but yeah, all God, of them lots are of pretty bad. Here. Yeah. <laughs> Look at this white. <laughs> Not, yeah. It's like the reddest That's what, I know we were Red talking Oceans. about it while we were, yeah. <laughs> yeah, while we were catching up before too. And, you know, we were talking about, you know, kind of the conversation. Um, yeah. yeah. So it's funny. You're like, yeah, I was looking for a category that, you know, it's like there's an opportunity like this one, six, only 600. <laughs> that was, that was then. Right. That's not even now yes. how many other people are like LMS or is it a CMS or LMS? Is it some other hybrid for onboarding? Like, you know, even now it's even more convoluted, but so, so, okay. So you're, you're on G2, you find the space. How, how do you decide on that? You know, I think a lot of people would be very nervous um, just yeah. because there are so many, you know, people in that space. Yeah. You know, what's counterintuitive is the category, even though it had a lot of competitors, and it's a pretty old category at that time, it was about 20 years old. Yeah. Um, there were not venture dollars flocking to the category. So that told me something that said, hey, this is usually what's counterintuitive. You want to go to the categories where VCs are not paying attention to, because you probably have your best chance of success if something major hasn't been funded there. And so what, when we looked at that category, we said, hey, this, is, this looks like an unsexy category, but the TAM is almost infinite. Uh, the total addressable market is almost infinite. Everyone needs to train in some capacity for every single job in the world. And so that was where we convinced ourselves to say, even though it's crowded on the surface, we think we can make a dent here because no venture dollars or no big venture dollars are going towards it. And there's no clear breakout winner. And so that was kind of our decision criteria. And so once we saw that and we committed, then we started to dive in. And then it was all about, hey, how do you get to product market fit? Or I also call it um, uh, essentially go to market uh, fit as well, too. And so can then it was just a journey that? Okay, for, for some folks, Ted, can you define that? Here's what I think. I think people are like, we got 30 customers, product market fit, boom, nailed it. We're doing, you know, a few hundred thousand dollars, like product market fit, crushed it, right? Like, how, <laughs> how do you, you know, <laughs> trust me, I talk to a lot of founders every year. Um, and, you know, how do you really think about that? And I think even just for like the lay person, you know, people that are that are like yep. listening to this, it may not be like, you know, in this kind of world, like, you know, product market fit is one of those things where, you know, we, chances are by, by the time something finds you, it's at product market fit. Um, a lot of companies early on, you know, anybody who's, who's kind of, there's a great book, it's called um, Crossing the Chasm. It talks about the adoption curve, right? And uh, knowing when you're in the in early adopters or, you know, innovators and then early adopters and then the early majority. And a lot of people think, you know, when they're, they're, they're selling to 25 or 40 innovators that they're now in the majority of that. And, and so how did you at WorkRamp, how did you start, how did you define, or like, when did you really believe that you had it? And, and I don't know if it's advice for other people too, but, but like, what are the things that you look for when you think about like, no, 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 this is, this is a thing, you know, like this is a thing and, and, and going to going to be a thing in whatever space it's in. So our category is a little different. I would say if you're going into the existing category, which a lot of startups are today, you kind of have the proverbial product market fit uh, already solved. And so um, when we went to the LMS category, our product was always there. Um, it was more about, hey, what's the go-to-market fit I love that. for us or how do we enter into the market? And so, and, and for example, if you're building new commission software today, if you're going after exactly or Captivate IQ, you kind of know what software you need to build. Like it's not, it's not rocket science, right? So you'll have product, product market fit mostly out of the gate. You're probably going to struggle on, hey, what is the way I get, this, get to this go-to-market fit? And for us... The proof was in the pudding, mostly from the numbers and the rep productivity. And so uh, when we saw our first rep productive on their own, that was when we knew we had go-to-market fit. We actually uh, went through two reps before we got to the third rep, who when she came in, her name is Danielle Scott, 
she just crushed it and she could sell it better than I could. And she was closing full capacity months and I could see her, her um, quality even drop because she was so busy. That was when we knew we had go to market fit. And once we saw that, everything else followed from there. But until we had that first productive rep truly on their own, yes, I gave her some resources and some decks uh, or sure, I, I would make them on the side for her. But once she could sell the product fully on her own, that was a go-to-market fit moment for us. And so I, my, my advice to entrepreneurs is if you're going into an existing category, and let's say you're the 2.0 version or the 3.0 version, yes, you might have some nuances in your product, but it's much more interesting to care about the go-to-market fit. And, it's in the, and the proof is in the numbers pudding which is, hey, how, how much velocity can you get with reps that aren't you? I love that. And that, that's, that's the key. And did you feel like, again, when you found that, the other thing I think about is repeatability. So you find one, yep. and you're like, okay, this is this. Like, you know, d- does it snowball immediately? Like how, like, how did it happen for you all? Because I think a lot of people, and, and I think this is anyone who's interested in entrepreneurship or you're scaling a business, it doesn't matter what the product, like some of these things we're talking about, these are universal. You know, and, and so how did you, so you've got the first, that's that first signal. Okay, there's a person because you could also say, well, I found a person, but she or he is a, you know, what I would consider like a lone wolf, which just for everyone out there is a persona of salesperson that actually a lot of people associate with sales, which is like the, man, I don't know what this guy does, you know, but they're good. Um, and, and you know, it, it can be tough to replicate that person. And so, you know, and you thought about really, let's say scaling or building repeatability, you know, like how did that process evolve? You know, for anyone who's starting a company or thinking about it or running a company, I think this is another, the next, next phase outside of like the founder led sale. Totally. You know, there's a topic a lot of people don't talk about. You usually talk about, Hey, you transition from founder led sales then to an actual sales led sales. And then people think it's smooth sailing from there. But there's actually one more step a lot of people don't test. And the part of the story I didn't tell you is we, so we essentially had two reps who failed, then we had her. She did amazingly well. But then the question next is, hey, is she a unicorn? And the answer to that was probably yes. She was a unicorn um, in terms of she was very good at sales. She went to Stanford. She was very personable, uh, had a good track record, and she could do it well. But then we had essentially two more reps after that who did not do so well. They didn't do extremely bad, but they didn't do as well. And then all the reps after those two succeeded. And so what we noticed was, hey, we had the early glimpses of go-to-market fit, but then we had a short period of time where it's like, hey, you're there, but you kind of had most of the signal, but you need to still shore up a few things. And that took another three to six months. But once those are shored up, then all the reps after that start to work. And so you then want to, you kind of get to go to market fit, but then you want to clarify, hey, is that just a really good rep or what's the true signal? And it was like, hey, you're mostly there, but not fully there. You need to keep developing to actually get the full go to market fit. And that took about two more reps after that. But once we, once we hit that, um, uh, then the extreme acceleration start to happen. We saw some acceleration, but once we actually had the reps after that, then it was then we saw extreme acceleration. Yeah, and let's let's talk. I mean, we talked a lot about kind of scaling the business, right? And kind of the early days. And I think for anyone who's an entrepreneur or thinking about starting a company, you know, I think the you know everything that Ted's talking about, I think, is like a really great recipe for you. You know, it's like okay. Um, I can sell these clothes to my friends or whatever it is, you know, okay, can somebody else? Okay, you know, were they able to do it? And 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 also, I think too the other the other lesson, Ted, that I've got from this too, is that I also see a lot of founders, it's like, man, they have that first failed rep, the second failed rep, maybe even a third, or an SDR, like a, there's a great CEO, uh, Brett Adcock, who's ran a company named Vettery that's ended up selling for six, uh, I guess, one, two, three, nine figures. Um, and you know, he couldn't get SDRs to work. And so he's like, I'm firing myself as CEO. Like, you know, they hired three or four, I'm going to figure out this first phase of this kind of go to, you know, the, the go to market fit. And then, he, you know, he ended up becoming that but then he didn't do it in a founders led way. He did it like in a anybody can do this way. And then boom, it all clicked. Then they started then they were just hiring in, hiring and hiring in. And I think sometimes entrepreneurs are like, well, you know, they kind of it's that limiting belief of, 
you know, well, okay, should we hire more people? You know, how does it work, et cetera? So I think it's just a good story for people of, you know, there's already a market out there, my friends. <laughs> you already knew there was a market. And it's just, we, we just haven't, I call it pick the lock, you know, and like, and then once you pick the lock, the floodgates kind of opened. So I think it's a, a great lesson for anyone who's you know, thinking about running a business, who's running a business now, or who's running a sales org now. Um, let, let, I want to shift gears a little bit and maybe just talk a little bit more about, you know, I'll talk, you know, I talked to a lot of different CEOs and other leaders about this kind of new work world that we live in. And so for those of you who don't know, um, and FYI, WorkRamp did not sponsor this, um, you know, this sponsor this podcast. Um, <laughs> it's the, the Ted is just an expert in this space from all the work, you know, talking to hundreds and hundreds of companies. I want to talk about like this idea of the future of work. And the future of work, I think is, you know, talked about a lot. I think remote work is talked about just as much as well, too. Uh, you know, like I would, I, as somebody who's talking to HR and business unit leaders every single day, and every week, you know, you're talking to your clients, your big customers, your medium customers, your small customers. How are th people thinking about investing in their people right now? Because I think, you know, we, we say, like, crap, like, how do we do this in a remote environment? And then kind of we throw some stuff against it and say, oh, well, we're offering development, but it kind of comes in the form of like, figure it out yourself development. You know, how, how are you seeing organizations adapt and really thrive? And maybe if there's some trends that you see in organizations that really get people up to speed quickly, you know, create an engaged, you know, workforce and, and are, you know, kind of nailing this, you know, remote onboarding slash remote growth world. Yeah. So when COVID hit, everyone had, everyone had to transform their thinking. And no matter how you've gone back to work, whether it's fully remote or in the office again, or hybrid, You've had to adapt how you're investing in your people. And I think the thing that, or the quote that sums it up the best is Andy Grove, you know, the former um, Intel CEO and late Andy yeah. Grove, he always said, hey, your number one highest leverage activity as an organization is training. And if you think about it, he, he, runs, he does some back of the napkin math in his book, High Output Management. If you do a one-on-one -on -one training session, that's going to be great. It's going to help improve one person. Uh, so one hour might return you another hour of improvement from that from that single individual. But if you take that single hour and put thirty people in a in a room, and you train thirty people, uh, there's a potential you could get thirty x that output right from that same amount of input you put into the system. And he had he is very well known for having the systems level thinking like this across organizations that were tens of thousands of people. And so if you extrapolate that further, um, and Andy Grove passed away, I think, before the pandemic, um, it, it rings extremely true now. If you think about the environment now, where there are a lot of layoffs, um, unfortunately, right now, uh, people are having a hard time connecting with their specific jobs or their coworkers um, in a remote environment. Um, so much of it comes back to learning and training in your organizations now. And so what we like to tell um, our customers and what we're also seeing in the industry is that you need to think about investing in your people and investing in your learning as a core differentiator of how your company will succeed in this new uh, mode of work. And then we talk about learning specifically, which is our, our category where we call learning as a growth engine and learning essentially can help one increase your top line through much better sales um, and sales uh, efficacy uh, two it could help uh, save uh, customers by doing customer education and increasing engagement so you reduce churn risk and then lastly if you offer these learning opportunities to employees you can help retain them better and help them be more effective in their day-to-day -day roles and so to answer your original question the new future work is all about hey our people are our number one asset. How do we make them more effective? And the highest leverage activity is through training. And then that's where we like to come in as an organization is how do we help you uh, further those efforts? Yeah. And, and, but I mean, how do you, like, whenever you're talking to leaders, you know, what are, like, what are you hearing from them about, you know, again, like, is it, is there a theme that you hear? And obviously now we're kind of in this, you know, uncertain times, um, which feels like we kind of stopped saying that. And now here we are, you know, saying it again, and 12 months later for different reasons. 
like what are leaders telling you? Like what are you know some of the top either learning and development orgs or HR or CEOs like what like what are they telling you in terms of like what they're seeing in terms of you know why their people are staying like what like what what seems to be resonating you know like most with them in terms of like how they're keeping the best people or, or kind of persevering through the, the through right now. Yeah, for sure. I was I was working with a customer um, uh, the other week and. In their engagement survey recently, this is a big drink manufacturer um, and uh, down, down in Southern California, and he was saying their number one piece of feedback from their engagement survey was that people were looking for more opportunities to develop within their organization and uh, specifically learning and development opportunities. How do I move to that next role? How do I go get that next skill? How do I um, uh, be better at my immediate craft? And so it's our job right now um, as, as people leaders is to give those opportunities to our individuals because they, they're, they'll do their day jobs well, but they also want to know, hey, what's next for me? And what's key from a learning development standpoint is we are the gateway to help figure out what's next. And uh, I subscribe personally to the philosophy, and I see this a lot from uh, our, uh, the customers we work with is if you've heard of Reed Hoffman, he talks a lot about tours of duty. Tours of duty is he believes organizations every 18 to 24 months should be shuffling their people up and around the organization. And so every 18 to 24 months, you should be preparing to take those individuals into another part of the organization or move them up in their career. You don't want to leave them stagnant. And so what we're seeing in the field is that hey, um, the buyers that we work with, the CPOs, the CROs, uh, the VPs of CS, they're all looking for, hey, how do I help move my people around the organization? And how do I actually give them the skills and opportunities to go get those next roles every 18 to 24 months? Because that's what creates a fluid and dynamic organization that will uh, out-innovate and move more quickly than their peers or competitors. Yeah, I think that, that it's such a good call out because a lot of people do, I don't know, like the old, uh, like performance reviews. Um, and what I find and, and even the, you know, the we're kind of moving from this world of you know, they used to call it the career ladder to the career lattice. Um, and for yeah. anybody who's not familiar, you know, it's the concept of for a lot of people, I mean, even like, look at, you know, Ted in your career, right? It's like, I was in sales, and then I started this startup. And then I went back into sales, and then I went into product. And then I started my own company again. And you know, it's successful now. Um, and I think for a lot of people, you can actually retain really great people. But you know, sometimes you have to shepherd the opportunities that I think sometimes organizations have the mindset that like, well, they'll they'll figure it out for themselves, and and that that there's definitely some truth, you know, in that without a doubt. But at the same time, more and more organizations, I think, have to think about those lattices, and you know, not that you have to push people into different groups, but to make sure that they understand other opportunities that are outside of just their typical, you know, you go from this role to then an enterprise executive, and then to this, and a, you know, whatever that might be. Yeah, and. and- when you think about the world that way, and you can't just wish it into being, right? That's the difficult part is there's a lot of infrastructure that organizations have to put together, right? So something as simple as the BDR to AE promotion path. We built this amazing uh, four-week program to actually get the BDRs ready for the actual AE role. It's very extensive. We use obviously work ramp for it. That's an example where it's like, hey, you can't just wish into being and just drop them into the AE role. There's a lot of training and infrastructure that needs to go into that so that they can be successful in those roles. Like if you think about going minor leagues to major leagues is a similar type of thing where they're kind of prepping you so that when you do get called up for the big leagues, you're ready to go. But there's a lot of infrastructure in place in those minor leagues that are essentially prepping you to get get ready for that next move. So that all comes back down to this new future work is, hey, you love to kind of say the right things. Um, And we're seeing CEOs do that. But you also have to take that next step and build the infrastructure in your organizations to do that as well. Yeah, that's a that's a great one. Um, And I think that there's, again, a lot of CEOs. And and, and I think like, for a lot of you listening here, like, well, I'm not a CEO, etc. I think the key is, um, 
you know, there's plenty of organizations that are doing a lot here. And the thing that I will add with, you know, some of the things that you're talking about, Ted, too, is like, for anyone in at any point in your career, the the additional advice I, I, is kind of two part, it's most organizations want to make you successful. And, and I think that I think we got we kind of grown up with these all these horror stories of like, oh, you can't raise your hand, or you can't do this. And I see so many people leave situations where it's like, have you asked your leader for, you know, development? Or have you asked for, you know, like classes or courses or, you know, a, a tool that can help uh, help them? Um, and and just really taking and that's the second part, a, a proactive approach in your own growth. And making sure like, and again, and the reason I kind of bring these two up together, Ted, is like, a lot of organizations have resources for you. And I think a lot of times, you know, there's kind of this mindset of like, someone will tell me what I need to learn. Someone will tell me how I need to be developed. And it's like, no, like you need to be able to self-diagnose. You need to be able to compare yourself to best practices, et cetera. And so for anyone out there listening, if you, you know, if you're really trying to, you want to look for organizations that are, you know, creating these, these lattices, you know, and then also on the flip side, you have to be investing in yourself as well, too. And, you know, there's a variety of ways you can do that, obviously, you know, through the platform, but obviously, there's other, you know, kind of ways that you can do that. But I think everyone listening has got to realize that in 2022 and beyond, your an organization is going to get you to point A, and then you have to choose if point A is good enough for you. And if you instead, you want to grow to, to you know, point B and, you know, and up to Z and, and beyond, and that a lot of organizations will struggle to do that, you know, completely. What are what are trends that you're seeing in the the way that people want to level up, right? And and what I mean by that is that you know you, you see kind of the it used to be you'd almost have these and, and I went through this at a company called Career Builder. I was putting this executive leadership program. It was, it was fucking great. Like I, they had brought in, it was in Chicago. I flew there every three months. It was you know professors from University of Chicago, Northwestern, and it was just really like you know kind of hands on. Then you've got your more classic, you know. LMS, where it's like, there's just a bunch of trainings that I can go and view. And then you've got some things that are customized. Like, how are you seeing organizations helping people to level up differently? You know, or is it kind of the same, you know, same similar constructs? But like, how is this whole space in terms of how we're getting people, you know, not, not just getting people to be more effective, but helping people to level up? Um, differently than, you know, how we might have done it with just a bunch of e-learning modules, you know, 10, you know, eight to 10 years ago. Yeah, there's, there's a multitude of options um, that we, we really see with customers. And you kind of want to have a multifaceted approach, right? Even here internally at WorkRamp, we have a learning stipend that people can use to essentially level themselves up. And, and uh, for example, one of our product managers, she uh, personally just leveled herself up by taking a, a really great reforged class on product management and coming back and sharing those learnings with the broader team. And so that's one approach where it's like, hey, we will give you cash. Feel free to go level yourself up. Now there's some in intricacies there where companies don't advertise that well enough or they don't promote it or they're kind of make it merit-based. Our recommendation is you kind of need to put it out there and market it and allow people to level up from there. So that's kind of more the onus on the employee, uh, but you can you can actually hand over the the incentives there as well. Uh, there's other ways we also uh, see from from uh, customers and in the category is essentially the the programs you would put in place to help people level up. And so those are things like having job boards that are open or encouraging people to interview um, um, uh, other people in other roles to see, hey, where can I level up to? Because a lot of the times it's like, hey, I just don't know what to level up to or where to level up to. So you have the infrastructure in place for that, or you go all the way out to having uh, in, in extensive programs within your organizations like leadership development programs. And so those are usually the trends we're seeing today is, hey, let's see how we can invest and let a lot of people to freely go level themselves up and then also have the infrastructure and programs internally to allow them to level up uh, with the resources available. At the end of the day, too, uh, the last thing I'll say is you need to encourage the managers to train yes. their direct team members to encourage them to level up. Or we'll yes. see, um, let's call it, um, uh, managers who, who don't exceed as much with their direct employees are the ones that are not pushing their direct employees to go level themselves up on a consistent basis. And so the best managers are the ones that say, hey, 
I see this talent that we have. I'm going to push them to go level up because I know if I don't, they will feel stagnant and they will leave over time. So the best ones are the ones that are pushing them to uh, either of those two options I mentioned uh, earlier. Yeah, and I mean, and I look for anyone listening to this. I think this is one of the most important pieces that you just brought up. Ted is literally talking to a private equity fund about this yesterday, and the the thing in there, and we have to invest in frontline leaders. <laughs> that yeah. is the punchline here. You know, you talked about you. It's a great example, the Andy Grove example. Uh, the guy's a legend. He's written some really amazing books, by the way. Um, is it's the same if, if you have a, a manager who has 10 people on their team or maybe it's eight i don't care and the manager gets better the eight people will most likely improve as well too and i think for so many people out there what we've what i feel like we've forgotten is we've we invest so much time in like entry level frontline people and then after you get past that you're like you're good dude you're good like you made it to leadership. Congratulations. Like, and now figure it all out on your own. And, and I feel like that's just a foundational flaw we have in a lot of, you know, sales and marketing in particular, but I, I think it's probably rampant in other organizations where we have this under focus on leadership development, because once you've achieved even frontline leadership, apparently you're supposed to like know how to do that. Like, even though you were just a top performer, um, you know, how how do you guys think about that? Again, like the idea of, again, we're talking about like leverage here and we've talked about this a little bit and as we start to wrap up, I've got a couple more questions, but you know, like how do you, and maybe you can talk about either you or, you know, or other organizations you were at, but how do you think about leveraging the frontline people who have the leverage, you know, who can create the leverage, you know, with their teams? Yeah, you bring up a really good point where, where I made a ton of mistakes early on thinking that management just happens. And if you get a bad manager in place, it can be a poison to the entire organization. And so it actually forced me to rethink the entire interview process from a, for leaders that we interview or leaders that we promote is that, that that's probably one of the most critical roles you could fill are those frontline managers or those second line managers. And so I would say, hey, have extreme focus on those first couple managers that you bring in, especially if you're a startup. Um, you want to make sure you nail those because those will set the tone. And, and again, I've experienced those uh, mistakes myself, and it's, and it's really hard to recover from. Um, and so uh, I recommend a, a ton of effort there. And then on an ongoing basis, then that means you got to continue leveling them up as well. We do. Uh, essentially monthly manager trainings. We have a leadership development program, even at our size, we're about 175 people today, but you do get so much leverage from those frontline managers or second line managers. I'd say that's one of the most critical groups that you can train within your, mm -hmm. within your companies. And so mm -hmm. uh, that's a great point you bring up, Jake. A lot of people overlook that. They think, Hey, your manager, you, you'll probably figure it out because yeah, you, you were a good performer. Yeah. You were a good performer. So you're going to be a great manager, but that's rarely the case. Yeah, you'll figure it out. It'll all work out. Um, all right. So as we start to wrap up here, tell me like what's next for you? What's next for WorkRamp? Like what first, let's start with you personally. Like what's next for you? Like what are you excited about? Obviously, you guys have been cranking now for, you know, what, seven, seven plus years, you know, six, seven plus years now. Like what, like what are you excited about, you know, for like kind of like the next chapter? You know, I think obviously the pandemic kind of accelerated our need for tools like this, but you know, obviously there's, there's the next evolution. So what, what's next and what's new and exciting for both you and for the company? Yeah, for sure. This is a really fun time. I, I like to tell uh, other founders that every stage of the journey feels different. You have kind of your zero to one stage when you're getting to product market fit or go to market fit. And I'm really excited about this, this stage. And it's actually less stressful is the scaling stage. We're about 175 people. We started the year about a hundred people just raised our Series C from Salesforce. And right now it's all about scale and then also continued product innovation as well too. And so for us, it's, it's basically doing two big things. One is how do you operationalize this so you can move internationally, you can move into new markets, move into new segments. You have a really good base of customers you can work from. So those are kind of uh, more the go-to-market related efforts. But also in this stage, it's important, and I've seen this in other companies, is you can't take uh, your foot off the gas from a product innovation perspective. And so 
in our category right now, where we've really disrupted the LMS category, we're thinking about, hey, how do we go from not just a single point product, the LMS, into an entire learning platform as well, too. You look at the best companies today, the Datadogs, the Octas, uh, the DocuSigns, maybe not, not the best recently, but uh, historically in SaaS, they've all gone from single product to multi-product to platform. And so um, our goal in this stage is, hey, how do we keep pushing on the product innovation, but then start thinking more holistically uh, from a platform-centric approach too. So this is a very fun phase where you can, one, spend half your day on the go-to-market side, make sure that's executing extremely well. It's really fun to literally win every single uh, new sale or renewal all the way out to, then you can spend the second half of your day really thinking about the product innovation to see how do you go from single to multi-product to platform. And so that's what we're excited about uh, right now. So uh, and hopefully hopefully in a couple of years, we'll make it back into uh, IPO land if, if the market's on freeze. I'm sure it will. I'm sure it will. And I think, you know, again, and the other kind of last lesson there is I think for a lot of organizations, just think, you know, again, I think a lot of companies too, like, or, you know, you feel like you have to go to multi-product really quickly, right? Or you have to try to be a platform. That's not really how it works for most people. You know, in reality is you get very good and you form these beachheads. Um, and then you you kind of, the market will help to tell you, you know, it's not, not, not that it's just, oh, you're only relying on that. You're also, you know, thinking about the things that the market may not know that they need yet, but I think it's just a really good, I kind of, I've been jotting down notes, this single multiple platform, because I really feel like that anecdote is is applicable to any, candidly, anybody, anybody, if you're an entrepreneur, you're starting a business, even if you're a, you know, a, a building and scaling a sales org, it's like you kind of nail a motion. And as opposed to trying to just go th- so thin, you like, we want to be best in class at channel and enterprise and mid market and SMB. And we have 12 people in the sales org. It's like, no, no, like it's, that's not how this, that's not how successful companies typically do it. So, um, so look, Ted, I really appreciate it, man. I think this has been a really fun conversation. I think anyone who's interested in scaling, um, you know, your thoughts on what organizations are doing around retention, I think there's going to be a lot of takeaways for the audience. So really appreciate you joining. Jake, thanks for having me on. It was fun. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you again, Ted. And thank you everyone for joining us this week. And we will see you all next week on the Jake Dunlap Show. All right. Thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in to another extremely fun and interesting episode. I thought it was fun and interesting, so I hope you did too, of the Jake Dunlap Show. Uh, Really great just breaking down everything that makes people who they are, the success, the trials and errors. And I hope that you enjoyed it as much as I did. Make sure to subscribe on your favorite platform and make sure more than anything to go over to jakedunlap.com. That's where you're going to stay up to date on all the latest guests, additional details, prep notes. We're going to be sharing everything on jakedunlap.com. So go ahead, go over there. You can subscribe there as well too. And we will see you next week on the Jake Dunlap Show.